Welcome, in the name of Jesus, the Savior of the world. We are gathered to worship, to proclaim Christ crucified and risen, to remember before God D, to give thanks for her life, to commend her to our merciful Redeemer, to comfort one another in our grief. We give God thanks. All who are baptized into Christ have been have put on Christ. In baptism, D was clothed with Christ. As she died, Christ embraced her in glory as she was surrounded by the heavenly host. Today, in your presence, O God, we give thanks for loving D at birth, in life, and in her dying. We live trusting in your promise of eternal life. Amen. I invite you to take the red hymnal from in front of you to turn toward the large numbers to the back of the hymnal, number 856. We join in singing together, How Great Thou Art. I invite, invite you to rise as you're able.
The grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, the love of God, and the communion of the Holy Spirit be with you all. Let us pray together. Almighty God, source of all mercy and giver of comfort, graciously tend to those who mourn, that casting all their sorrow on you, they may know the consolation of your love through your Son, Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. I invite the congregation to be seated. Good morning, everyone. My sister Lene and I would like to thank you for joining us this morning as we share a few of our favorite memories of our mom. Our mom had a great sense of humor. She could be really funny, sometimes a bit inappropriate. Other times her humor would be really dry. And then, occasionally, it verged on what some may think of as mean. I think she's laughing right now. We've had a really mild, practically snow-free winter and yet here we are in the midst of a three-day severe weather warning surrounding her funeral. It took us quite a few conversations to find the date that would work for all of us, and we ha get to have bad weather. Part of me believes this is mom's doing, just to be sure her funeral would be memorable. Like I said a moment ago, thank you for braving the weather and joining us this morning. A few things about mom. Mom's favorite colors were purple and blue. Lene and I decided that we would pay homage to our mother this morning and to wear her favorite colors. Lene's even borrowed a jacket from mom's wardrobe and to wear, holding a mom memory close as we bid farewell. If you had an opportunity to look at the memories table in the back, you may have noticed the vase of artificial, also known as permanent, flowers on the table. Mom's favorite flower is the yellow rose. More than 50 years ago, Mom's husband Bob gave her that vase of permanent yellow roses and Mom treasured them. When she moved to Arizona after Bob died, the roses went with her. Years later, when mom moved back to Minnesota, as my sister Joey was in her last months, when mom moved back, excuse me, the roses were packed in the car. Not long after Joey died and a good old fashioned Minnesota winter set in, excuse me, mom elected to go back to the warmth and sunshine of Arizona. And of course, the roses went with her. And then they came back again to Minnesota when mom suffered a stroke and we had to move her home for good. Those roses were moved a few more times and they were on the table near her bed at Emerald Crest Memory Care, beginning about six years ago and continuing through her last breath about a month ago. Mom was a creative cook and had had several recipes published in cookbooks over the year. In, um, for an example, would be Bon Appetit. She had several published in their cookbooks. As one of her food testers, there were a few dishes that were not necessarily cookbook material, but then they were printed in the Star Tribune. So again, at the memory table, you may have seen the article that, that was in the Star Trip that has mom, Lene, our sister Joey, and me, and I was the one in the high chair, by the way, um, when mom was cooking it. It had a few of her recipes there, and one of them was called Rice and Franks. But we always, as kids, called it Orange Wieners and Rice. And it was one of those acquired taste kind of things, but we all liked it. So uh, over the years, Joey, would make the orange wieners and rice, and she'd invite us over to enjoy it, which the three of us did. I'm not sure why exactly, 
But none of the husbands or children were ever interested in that. Hmm. Oh, well, it was good sister bonding time. Mom thoroughly enjoyed being a part of Toastmasters International. She joined the Richfield Club in 1970, and it ignited her strengths in public speaking, mentoring, leadership, and organization as well as being a stepping stone to her involvement in many associations, organizations, and projects. She received innumerable accolades, plaques, and honors within Toastmasters and held many chapter, district, and regional offices. Whether she was living in Minnesota or Arizona, being active in Toastmasters was an important part of her life. Two stories that I'll share about mom and Toastmasters. For many years, the Richfield Club volunteered to work with the Minneapolis Aquateneo. And mom would coordinate the effort of having Toastmasters that would be at every event throughout the then two week event. Um, and they would introduce the speakers, they would introduce the event, and they would take care of that, so no one from the Aquitaineal had to give that a thought. And the second one is that there was one time when mom was adamant about me going to listen to a speech that she was giving. And so even though I had turned her down many times, this time I knew it would be different. So I agreed to go. I, I must say before I go further that my mom always gave her age as 26, <laughs> always. We tacked on an end holding for a long time, but she was 26. Mom proceeded in her speech to regale the audience with how I had aged and I was now 26. And so how it felt for her to now be the youngest in the family including her belief that there were many benefits to being youngest. Spoiled, less chores around the house, getting more of the things that one wants. I could go on, but I won't. My sister will get jealous. That was supposedly a humorous speech. For some reason, the other Toastmasters kept looking at me as Mom made her points. Not sure why. And lastly, I wanted to share that mom and I often drove each other crazy. But no matter what, we knew we could always count on one another. She was my mom, I was her daughter, and we loved each other. We supported and had each other's back. I was heartbroken as mom's dementia diminished her memories of the relationship we had and who we were. Yet, I knew those memories lived on in our hearts. Less than a week before Mom died, God blessed me with a gift. I was with Mom in her room at Emerald Crest and told her I was going to go see a member of the staff and would be back in a few minutes. Now, by that time, Mom hadn't remembered my name for a really long time, and Actually, she thought I was on staff, so, and her voice was very, very quiet, so we could hardly hear anything that she said. So as I walked toward the door to leave her room that day, loud and clear, Mom said, Sherry, come back. I want to talk to you. And my mouth just dropped open, and I slowly turned, and was just so grateful that I knew she remembered me and that I was able to hear her so clearly. And how oh, we miss her so much. We know that we will be with mom again someday. Now, let's hear some memories from Lene. Okay, well, this is what mine looks like. So <laughs> here we go. Um, first, thank you. Thank you all of you for being here with us today. It means an awful lot. And I, I see old friends and dear friends, and we appreciate it very much. And you got to stop crying. I got you got to stop. 
Mom was so creative. She liked to sew. She made costumes for us for dance recitals and for Halloween, and she made matching dresses for my sisters and I, and she, she, she was a great seamstress. By far, though, the most, uh, by the way, I speak with visual aids. I think it's my elementary education, but um, <laughs> the most memorable and the only long-lasting thing that she made was in this box, which put, dates back 73 years. It was from Empire Made Lingerie, but it really isn't lingerie. This is what Mom made from her Oh gosh, <laughs> from her wedding dress and um, the slip as well. This was uh, worn by eight little girls. We had um, myself first born 73 years ago and Lene, Sherry, my sister Joey, our sister Joey. Three girls, three daughters, three granddaughters that are Yes, that's Catherine and, and, and Laura and Andrea, and not in that order. And then also two great-granddaughters, which is, which is uh, Elise and Grace. So eight of us, is that eight? Three, six, eight, yes. Eight of us wore this dress, and it's something we kept, have had all these years, and it means a lot to us. Okay, this one will do it. Oh, good. Okay. It's, it's a baptismal tradition that is dear to our hearts. Um, Mom also did some other things like needlepoint and cross stitch and those kinds of things. But the one, there's two things that I really remember the most. One is she made button bases. She made these hundreds, right? Yes. If not a thousand. If not a thousand. She made hundreds of these, of these button bases and she was in, when she was in Arizona, she sold them, and she volunteered in a hospital gift store, right? Casa Grand Regional Medical Center. Okay. She volunteered there, and she was able to sell these kinds of gift items. Yes. Well, when she moved back to Minnesota, they didn't sell. So she continued to make them, but then she personalized them, and she gave them to family and friends and anybody that she just had a heart for. So that's one of the creative endeavors. The other one, you can't really see this, but this is a picture, excuse me, of a dollhouse that mom made. She had been in um, a balloon accident, a hot air balloon accident, and she, as she was recovering, she decided to make this dollhouse. This dollhouse is um, two stories high, five or six uh, rooms inside and she decorated every one of them individually differently and she went on not only to decorate it but she also handmade the pets and the people and the furniture that were in the house this house i don't think you even know this this house took on it's still living it's still with us yes not with us but uh, my friend who is an architect has the house now, and she is doing a drastic remodel and update, but it's still something Mom put together. Mom had pizzazzed. She loved going out to dinner and dancing. She loved fashion. She loved wearing fancy dresses and matching shoes and matching purses. She loved jewelry. She loved jewelry. She wore big dangly earrings, and in every picture, I'm sure I could, I could bet on it. Every picture out there, she's got necklaces and something. She um, liked attending and hosting parties. She's had family, friends, and colleagues involved, and she created fun events, I have to read this sentence, with decor, food, music, and sometimes even a dress code tailored to the party theme. She was beautiful. Flair, pizzazz. Mom loved playing games, especially dominoes. She took her game seriously, and there was one time, not long ago, I don't remember. Elise, was it Elise? Who was no, it? it was Laura. It was Laura, Laura's not, yeah. It was Laura, there she is. It was Laura who kept winning 
and thwarting mom's every move. So mom got a little unhappy. She gave Laura the look and her, in her most loving tone. And then I have to read this part too. Mom said, you little sh <laughs> You fill in that four letter word. To this day, when we play dominoes, we still laugh at that memory. I only have two left. Kids in the corner. Mom loved to play kings in the corner. <laughs> Kids too. Kings in the corner. Mom loved to play games, and this is a very special one for Sherry and me. Sh Sher I went on Tuesdays and Thursdays. Sherry went over the weekends, and we, we always played this game with Mom. We were in her room, and it's, as she aged and changed, we, we changed the game, and we played it for a long, long time. Oh, my goodness. In her room at Emerald Crest. I need a minute. Oof. We will be forever grateful for the loving, caring staff at Emerald Crest. I have to take a minute and describe it. It's, it's uh, five houses on a cul-de-sac, and each house is in, alike on the inside. Uh, Mom had a room in house five and then was moved to house three. Uh, kitchen, dining room, living room, and six rooms on each side. It was small and she received wonderful care, and I'm grateful for them. Mm. Okay, one more story, I gotta move on. One more story, and that is, mom was a lifelong volunteer, and this is a representation of her most favorite, we think, most favorite activity, mm -hmm. um, other outside of the postmaster stuff, but yes. Mom enjoyed volunteering, she was a rocking, reader at Valley View Elementary School, which is someplace close by here, I think. It's not too far away. So mom was a rocking reader, and she read with kindergartners. She had five or six, and she read with them one at a time. They would draw pictures when they weren't reading with her for Miss D. They called her Miss D. Some of them started to call her Grandma Eva. Even. She loved the kids, and they loved her. Rocking grandma. Rocking grandma. Mom was hardworking, feisty, complicated, sentimental, creative, adventurous, smart, fun, brave, sassy, and even much more. She lived life with pizzazz. We will miss you, Mom. You are loved. That's it. Ooh, thank you. I'll leave it here. And. Coming up next will be Arlen. Arlen served the role of chaplain at Emerald Crest. So in the last six years, he's gotten to know mom really well, and in many cases, a mom that we didn't know. Yes. Hello. Um, yeah, as they said, my name is Arlen Solon. I'm the chaplain at Emerald Crest, which is a memory care facility not too far from here. Um, I would go there once a week to where Dee lived. And so once a week for five, six years is a lot of time together. Um, yeah, and, and so I do a worship service there each week. And the first week Dee was there, I remember her coming, and she did sit right in front, although there's not a real back row to sit in. And um, a lot of times afterwards, I go around and say goodbye to people, and I'll you know shake hands and give hugs to some people. And I gave Dee a hug, and she slipped ten dollars in my pocket. <laughs> I think that's all I need to say right there. That kind of says, just take it from there in every way you can. Um, I would guess she probably winked at me or kissed me on the cheek, maybe both, I don't remember for sure, but knowing her, I'm guessing one or two of those things happened, you know, one or both of those things happened. Um, yeah, D was complicated, you know. I think for much of Dee's life, in a lot of ways, she wasn't really happy. I don't think she liked herself a whole lot. Um, I think she had low self-esteem and 
Sometimes people like that um, hurt themselves directly and indirectly and kind of some of the people closest to them. And I think that certainly happened. Um, but I think those of us who know that know that, right? And yet we're all still here. And we cared for her and loved her and even liked her. You know, um, um, Laura told me, a, she said a good metaphor for her is when they talked about dominoes. And the way that Dee taught her to play dominoes was train dominoes. Each person has their own train. And you can only play on your own train. But if you're not able to play on your own train, you're vulnerable. And anybody can play on your own, on your train. You're vulnerable. And you hear about how competitive she was playing dominoes with her granddaughter even, you know. Um, being vulnerable was a scary thing. And so you want to do anything you can to be, keep yourself from being vulnerable. And if someone else is vulnerable, maybe it make, keeps you safer to go after them. Um, you don't want people to know you're vulnerable because if you are, people will hurt you. But D did a lot of good things too. I think sometimes some of that wanting to like yourself better, and I don't even know if she would have known to think that about herself, but it causes you to also do a lot of really good things. And she did a lot of um, volunteering in so many things, very involved, and was a very capable woman. Very capable woman. And I think, especially about um, Rock and Readers, it was called, you know. And, and Dee was not, um, I wouldn't describe her as a contented woman probably most of her life. She had moments of joy and sorrow and such, but I just imagine her reading to these kindergartners, you know. And it sounded like, you know, some of them wouldn't sit still real well, so she would bring things with them to occupy themselves while they sat and read. But just having those kids look at you and being able to be away from all other parts of her life and not think about those, but just have these little kids in front of you who just genuinely liked you and thought, wow, what a nice lady, you know? This is a nice lady and was told how good she is. <laughs> I just think about the um, gift shop, too, you know, and this is a side note more, but in typical D fashion, she didn't often refer to it as the gift shop, right? It was a boutique. <laughs> <laughs> um, there were a lot of ways she volunteers with kids, and, and, and the Toastmasters working with high school students and leadership, um, and she was a good leader. She was a, knew how to get herself out there. I mean, there's newspaper articles about her and various things. A lot of that is because she got herself out there. She knew how to promote herself. She knew how to promote different things. She knew how to organize things. Um, and I think she was proud of that, and rightfully so. Um, but the last few years, you know, Dee was there, I think it was almost five years exactly, maybe it was six, I don't remember. And for, she had a stretch where it was a really tough time. You know, your dementia kind of progresses and changes. And she went through a stretch where it was really tough. But then she moved to a house, a different house in the same place and across there in a different room. And maybe it progressed, different staff, different residents. And she really thrived there. Um, this is where I saw Dee become a contented woman in a way I think she was not in much of her life. She seemed really at peace. Um, you see this happen sometimes with people. I think all the garbage that she had in her head that held her back, and some of it's dementia, and some of it's just perspective on life, I think, too. You get older and you realize what's more important. Um, yeah, contented. And she still looked nice, but she was less worried about looking flashy. Um, she was kind but didn't have to show that she was more kind or better than somebody else or that somebody else was worse than her. You know, there was no more pecking order for her. I think a lot of the people who lived in that house with her are people who um, had forgotten to have dementia and they're just who they are. And that's who kind of she was too. She was just free to be who she was. And the residents there, the staff there, they liked her. You know, she was a nice lady, you know. Um, there's people there who still ask about her. Um, you know, I think a story from this time, and I might get a detail or two wrong, there was a, 
uh, Christmas Eve or in Christmas time when she had, I think, did she break her hip or, and ended up at St. Gertrude's, right? So she was at St. Gertrude's in Shakopee, which is a um, you know, nursing home and transitional care units, and they have a special part of their transitional care unit where people go for physical therapy that specialize in people with dementia. It's a really good place. And I talked to Sherry around that time because I think it was she was over there over Christmas. And I knew a lot of things about Dee. I knew she liked young men, you know, like men of all ages probably, even <laughs> like young men. And there were young male staff who worked there that she really liked and, um, and who liked her. What I didn't know is that she also loved professional wrestling. And so Sherry stopped by there, I think it was on a Christmas Eve, and there was Dee sitting on a couch, male staff on her right, male staff on her left, watching wrestling. <laughs> and what a great Christmas that was for Dee, I'm sure. You know, what more could you ask for, right? But just, and even then, you know, just being comfortable in her own skin, being who she is. Um, you know, and, and Dee seemed to run away from peace a lot of her life or try to fill it in things that were temporary or whatever. Um, and very real in many ways, too. But, you know, God's peace seemed to find Dee. You know, Laura's going to be reading from Romans 8 that talks about nothing being able to separate us from the love of God. And when she's reading that, I want, you know, just think about ways maybe that we and, and D or all of us, you know, try to get away from God's love, but God's love still find us. And no matter what we do or don't do, God's love can find us. You know, D is now eternally at peace, too. Um, she's back with Joey, right? The number one daughter. Number one daughter. I mean, they were, they, oh, she's number two? Is Sherry number one? You're, well, but who was the favorite daughter? You were the favorite? I got this mixed up. I thought Joey was the favorite, and you were, no. No, never mind. Scratch that whole part. Um, but she is back with Joey, and she's with Jesus, and she is eternally content and eternally at peace. Amen. There's a peace I've come to know Though my heart and flesh may fail There's an anchor for my soul I can say it is well Jesus has overcome And the grave is overwhelmed the victory is won. He is risen from the dead, and I will rise on eagles' wings. No more sorrow, no more pain. I will rise when he calls my name before my God. Fall on a day that's drawing near when this darkness breaks to light and the shadows disappear and my faith shall be my eyes and Jesus has overcome and the grave is overwhelmed the victory is won. He is risen from the dead, 
Romans 8, 31 through 35, and 37 through 39. What then are we to say about these things? If God is for us, who is against us? God who did not, did not withhold his own son, but gave Jesus up for all of us, how will he not with Christ also give us everything else? Who will bring any charge against God's elect? It is God who justifies. Who is it to condemn? It is Christ who died, or rather, who was raised, who is also at the right hand of God, who also intercedes for us, who will separate us from the love of Christ. Will affliction or distress or persecution or famine or nakedness or peril or sword? No, in all of these things, we are more than victorious through Christ who loved us. Sorry, this is my confirmation verse from a long time ago. <laughs> For I am convinced that neither death nor life, nor angels nor rulers, nor things present nor things to come, nor powers, nor height, nor depth, nor anything else in all creation will be able to separate us from the love of God in Christ Jesus our Lord. Word of God, word of life. Thanks be to God. shepherd I'll not want. He makes me lie in pastures green. He leads me by the still, still waters. His goodness restores my soul. And I will trust I want 
work is past. I will not fear the evil one, for you are with me and your rod and staff are the comfort I need to know. And I will trust. John 14, 1 through 3. Jesus spoke to the disciples, Do not let your hearts be troubled. Believe in God. Believe also in me. In my Father's house there are many dwelling places. If it were not so, would I have told you that I go to prepare a place for you? And if I go and prepare a place for you, I will come again and will take you to myself so that where I am, there you may also be. Word of God, word of life, thanks be to God. Dear friends in Christ, grace to you and peace from God our Father, from our Lord, and from our Savior Jesus Christ. Amen. In the church year, we find ourselves in what we call Holy Week, this time between Jesus' triumphant entry into Jerusalem, where everyone was celebrating him, and the days of Jesus' suffering and death on the cross, and then Jesus' resurrection from the Easter Sunday. I feel like maybe in Dee's life, a lot of that has been lived out and those stories have been told and shared. And maybe that's true of a lot of us in our lives that we experience these moments of trial, these moments of feeling separated from others. But in those words that Paul writes in the book to the Romans, the letter to the Romans. Nothing separates us from the love of God that is in Christ Jesus our Lord. And so it's a promise that Dee held on to through her life that she knew that, that Jesus was there. It's the promise that she celebrated when she would show up in worship on those Sunday mornings, making that commitment to herself and and to her faith, recognizing that that was an important lesson to pass on to her family and to her friends as well. So as you share these stories and these moments, there's this thread of Christ's presence always and forever being in her life and in the knowledge of who she was and her identity that sense of Christ's presence that was with her even in those moments of her not remembering things. I love the words to I will rise. There's a peace that I've come to know, though my heart and flesh may fail. Even though the things that we count on through our lives may go away, There is an anchor for our souls where we can say, it is well. Because we know that that separation from Christ never happens in our lives. And so with that promise of Christ never being separate from us, we can hold to that promise that we hear from Jesus in the Gospel of John. I have prepared a place for you. Not just a 
place of kind of a mass humanity, but a place for each one of us by name. And so as we read and in different translations, we hear it's a mansion with many, many rooms. Or we just hear this idea of a place. Jesus isn't claiming just some faceless humanity. Jesus is claiming each one of us, knowing our flaws, knowing our inconsistencies, knowing the things that we said that maybe we think we should take back, knowing our honesty, knowing our desire to care for other people, knowing our desire to live out that love that Christ has for us in the best ways we can, knowing that it will be imperfect. In that promise, Jesus says, just as you are, that's how I claim you. All of these things that contain your brain and consume your mind in this world, all of those things will be released as chains. They will forever be gone when I claim you eternally for the rest of your life and beyond. That's the promise that D held on to. That's the promise that is given to each and every one of us in this gospel message of Jesus Christ. And so being here today on this Monday of Holy Week, in this in-between time, we hold to that promise, recognizing our humanity, recognizing D's humanity, recognizing our shortcomings, but recognizing also those moments where we are present in the best ways possible because that's who God has made us to be. And so with that love, God claims us and God says, death is not the final word. The love of Jesus Christ is. Amen. We'll be singing Amazing Grace, and a few times we'll go into the chorus, My Chains Are Gone. If you know those words, please join us and sing along. Amazing grace, how sweet the sound. That saved a wretch like me I once was lost But now I'm found Was blind but now I see T'was grace that taught my heart to fear and grace my fears relieve how precious did that grace appear the hour I first believe my chains are gone set free my God my Savior has ransomed me and like a flood his mercy reigns unending love amazing grace the Lord promise good to me his word my hope secures he will my shield and portion be as long as life endures my chains are gone God, my Savior. 
Savior has ransomed me, and like a flood, His mercy reigns, unending love, amazing grace. The earth shall soon dissolve like snow. The sun forbear to shine. But God who called me here below will be forever mine. Will be forever Let us join together in prayer. Holy God, grant us who are still in our pilgrimage and who walk as yet by faith, that the Holy Spirit may lead us in goodness and graciousness all our days. Hear us, Lord. Grant to your people forgiveness and peace, that we may be cleansed from all our sins and learn to serve you with acts of loving kindness. Hear us, Lord. Give courage and faith to those who are bereaved, especially Dee's family. We pray they may have strength to meet the days ahead in the comfort of a holy and certain hope and in the joyful expectation of eternal life with those they love. Hear us, Lord. Help us as we pray in the midst of things we cannot understand to believe and trust in the communion of saints, your steadfast love, and the resurrection to life everlasting. Amen. Together as God's people, we pray the prayer which Jesus taught. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever and ever. Amen. Eternal God, you have shared with us the life of Dee. Before she was ours, she was yours for all that Dee has given us to make us who we are, for that of her that lives and grows in us each day, and for her life that in your love will never end, we give you thanks. In your presence, we offer Dee back into your gracious arms. Comfort us in our loneliness. Strengthen us in our weakness. Give us courage to face the future unafraid. Make us faithful to serve one another. Give us that peace and joy which is eternal life through Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen. I invite you to once again take the red hymnal from the pew rack in front of you, turn to number 787, and we join in singing together on Eagle's Wings. I invite you to rise as you're able.
As this time of worship draws to a close, you are invited to join in a time of fellowship and a light luncheon downstairs in our fellowship hall. You'll find stairs as you leave out to the right of the sanctuary. If you require an elevator, there's one to the left out of the sanctuary, down to the basement, and invite you into a time of sharing uh, food and fellowship, some great memories and lots of laughter. And so to prepare for that meal, I invite us into a prayer. God, we give you thanks for this time of celebration and the food that we are about to receive. Use it to strengthen our bodies. Use it to strengthen our testimony in you. Thank you for the hands that have prepared it and for the many people involved in bringing this celebration together. We give you thanks for this time together in Jesus' name. Amen. And now open your hearts to receive this blessing. Turn your eyes upon Jesus. Look full in his wonderful face. And the things of earth will grow strangely dim in the light of his glory and grace. Let us go forth in peace. In the name of Christ, amen. Thank you so much for...